I encourage you to open back up in your Bibles to James, the third chapter this time. That was not planned that we read from James 5, but we're going to read from James 3 for just a couple seconds this morning. Not right at the beginning, but in a couple minutes from now. I do also want to say, before we get going on our lesson this morning, that I know that there are a lot of teachers, I know that there are a lot of students that are going back this year, I'm sorry, this week for teaching. Some of you have been at it for several weeks by now. Some of you never actually took a break at any point during the summer. Uh, to you people who are going back this year, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a student, I just want you to know that our thoughts are with you, our prayers are with you. I know that it is a tough world that you're in. I know that every time... Uh, I knew that eight, I'm sorry, I knew that eight years ago when we started teaching. Now that she's going back, I get another upfront view of how difficult it is. Now that my kids are in school, I see it even more as well. So those of you who are going back, whether as a teacher, whether as a student, just know that you have our prayers with you and we wish you the best for this school year. I don't know if you have a favorite president. I certainly do. I know several people here in, at, at Hillside are history buffs. I know they have a favorite president. If you have a favorite president, it's probably dependent on what your area of expertise is or what your area of passion is. Some people that love World War II history just love Harry Truman. I love Harry Truman. Maybe FDR. Some people like Teddy Roosevelt because he's the guy on the back of a horse that just, just kind of never seemed like he ever just got shot, never seemed like he ever got tired or anything like that. But I think most people, if you ask them what their favorite president would be, they would say probably Abraham Lincoln. No matter what you wear, how you rate presidents, Abraham Lincoln is certainly in the pantheon of greatest American presidents, primarily just because of all the amazing things that he did. This is the guy that, at least legally or maybe just as part of a speech, freed the slaves. He was the one whose sole purpose was to keep the Union together. And Abraham Lincoln did a lot of great things, but I think when we think about somebody like him, all we view sometimes is the strength. We see how tough he was. We see how strong he was. We see how much fortitude he had in everyday life. And sometimes that clouds the reality of what his life was like. Abraham Lincoln is a lot of things. He was a great guy. But one of the things that those people that were closest to him knew intimately about him was that he was a man who struggled deeply with depression. He was a man who struggled deeply with inadequacies, who felt like he was never enough, who always seemed to be despondent no matter how many successes he achieved in life. As a matter of fact, on the eve of the 1860 presidential uh, convention, when he was named as the Republican nominee for president, he was found at the end of, after all the circus, he was found at the end of the walkway, his hand in his tears, his head in his hands, in tears, because he said, I just never have felt more miserable in my entire life. It was a common practice amongst his friends to keep guns and all sorts of weapons away from him because you just never really knew what he could do. Abraham Lincoln, though marked by strength, one person remarked that there was no element of his character that was so obvious, so ingrained as his mysterious and his profound melancholy. And I think that's how a lot of us meet people like this. As we look at guys like this, we think, this is somebody who just did so many amazing things. Look at the strength that he has. Look at the fortitude. Look at the power. Because of that, we overlook the very real human element of them. And we do the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, with biblical characters. When we see people in Scripture, we look at them and all we see is the strength. We see Moses parting the waves, but, or parting the Red Sea. But we don't ever think about his two chapters of inadequacy where he talked about how he didn't feel like he was capable of leading the people out of Egypt. We look at somebody like John and we see his love that he had for the Savior, but we don't always see the fact that he never really, or that he had sometimes struggled with his anger. These are really serious issues that he had. And so sometimes we see the strength of these people, but we never really see the sadness of them. I think sometimes as Christians, and especially this belief happens sometimes amongst our denominational friends, the perception is, is that if you're a Christian, especially if you're a faithful Christian, or possibly the more faithful you are, the less despondent, the less sad, the less pessimistic, the less emotionally bankrupt you're allowed to feel. And I'm here to tell you right now that nothing could be farther from the truth. When you look at profound people in Scripture, not only are they marked by their successes, but they are oftentimes marked by their emotional pitfalls. Look at somebody, for instance, like Elijah. 1 Kings 18 is arguably the greatest triumph that any single prophet had over idolatry at any point in time. And 1 Kings chapter 18 is his victory over the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel to the point where these prophets of Baal talk for hours and hours and hours trying to get Baal to respond to that. Elijah makes fun of them for a little bit, which is hilarious by itself. And then he whispers a prayer towards God. God responds in an overwhelming fashion. 1 Kings chapter 19 finds him in a cave praying towards God that he would just simply take away his life. Because I'm worthless, Elijah says. Elijah had this great victory and it also marked by despair. You also have something like David. 
who had this enormous success. The first 12 chapters of 2 Samuel are marked by success after success, victory after victory. And then 2 Samuel 15 rolls around, where Absalom turns against David, his oldest son, at least at that point, arguably his favorite son that he would have, turns against him and leads a coup to literally not only take the throne from him, but to also tear down his reputation as well. And then you have somebody like Jeremiah, who is marked by not only great moments of strength where he preaches towards an unruly crowd, a crowd that hates him from cover to cover, but also eventually finds himself in Jeremiah chapter 38 at the bottom of a cistern, rotting away for days before he's rescued. And then you have John. I think quite a bit about John the Baptist. I think that John is one of those characters that, had he not been, and I say this as nice a way as possible, had he not been in the shadow of Jesus, we would look at somebody as arguably the greatest biblical character in Scripture. And even Jesus himself says that much. Of people born of women, there's no one that has arisen greater than John the Baptist. And yet, how does John end his life? In a cave, I'm sorry, in a prison, as his head is chopped off as a reward for an immodest dance rehearsal that happens two floors above him. John's life was marked by victory, and yet the end of his life was found in profound sadness. The defining characteristic of all these men, the defining characteristic of all of them, was not that they were somehow immune to emotional pitfalls. It was not that they were immune to depression and sadness. It was that they took those moments in their life and kept moving forward. That's why I wanted Nathan to lead that song. That phrase that we sing, one step at a time, defines my life as it should define yours. That we don't move from victory to victory. That we always don't go from mountaintop to mountaintop. But sometimes we just have to do, every single day, one step in front of the other, leaning perfectly on God. And this perception that we have sometimes, where Christians are to be emotionally strong all the time, that you're never allowed to be sad, is just not true. And I think you see that especially when Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about his thorn in the flesh. And how he mentions that over and over he had prayed to God that God would remove that thorn of the flesh from him. And then eventually he learned from God himself that my grace is sufficient for you. The idea that we're not allowed to be sad. The idea that we're supposed to be bulletproof is just not found in Scripture. As a matter of fact, I would say the opposite. That it is sometimes our sadness, our emotional down periods, that we find the strength not only to lean on God, but we exemplify that strength around other people. When people see us down, when people see us sad, when people see us going through tough times, they can see Jesus leading through us, living through us. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. One of the last things that Jesus says to his apostles in John chapter 16, verse 33, after telling them all the negative things that they're, things that they're going to go through, all the struggles, all the fights and all the issues that they're going to have, the persecution. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. He didn't say don't ever get down. He didn't say don't ever be sad. He didn't say don't ever look away at God. He never said any of that. He said take courage one step at a time, for I have overcome the world. That's what we need to be focusing on. And maybe I'm talking to this morning, this is not the wrap-up, by the way, and maybe that I'm talking to somebody right now who's in one of these moments where you are so far down, where you are so sad, where you are at a point where you just don't even know if you have the strength to move one foot in front of the other, that you don't know how you're going to get through the next hour, much less the next day. And for that, I have this to say to you. The first thing that you need to do is you need to take a long look inside. This is not a commentary on any one specific person. This is not a commentary on any one kind of thing where you say, okay, you're a horrible person and you just need to change your ways a little bit. You can read Psalm 42 to kind of look at that despondency that some people feel. But what I want you to do is look at what's said in James the third chapter. In James chapter 3, starting in verse 8, this is a very realistic understanding of our life as Christians sometimes. In James chapter 3, verse 8, he says, No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless, and is an, is a restless evil and is full of deadly poison. With it, verse 9, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. And from the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be this way. If you highlight or underline, that phrase at the end is a great one. When he said, these things ought not to be this way. What he's saying is, that's not how a Christian acts. You don't have both of these outputs from the same input, from the same source. Verse 11, does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. The mark of a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, is that what comes out of their mouth is to the glory of God. 
is blessings. Not always happiness and sunshine and rainbows, but it's at least not evil. And what he says in James chapter 3 is, is the tongue is a restless evil. You can bless, you can curse with it, but these things shouldn't have their heart inside of a Christian or find their root inside of a Christian's heart. That's not what a Christian is to be. And so it may be that if you're feeling down and you're feeling especially despondent, it may be that you need to do some soul searching and ask yourself, as he points out later in this, earlier in the same chapter, that I have my foot kind of in both camps. That I'm with God and I, I see those blessings and I see the end result. I see heaven, but I also have my foot in this camp. And that's where I really want to be at this point. And so I'm split down the middle and I'm despondent and I'm depressed because my heart is going in two different directions. And what James says is, don't be adulterer or don't be friends with the world because that makes you an enemy of God. Give your life fully to God. And it may be that we need to look within and see in our own life, am I trying to play both sides against the middle? Or am I somebody truly who has my heart 100% invested in God? In Acts the 8th chapter, Peter runs into an interesting character called Simon the Sorcerer. And if you're interested in extra biblical literature and traditional sources around the first century, Simon the Sorcerer commands an enormous amount of literature. He's somebody who almost retains this apocryphal state throughout the first couple of centuries. But as far as we know, in Acts chapter 8, Simon the Sorcerer interacts with Peter, and Simon the Sorcerer has a great beginning story. He's somebody who gives up all of his books, his magic books. He gives his life fully over to God. He's baptized, but then some wrinkles start to create themselves. And Simon the Sorcerer then says, what I would really love to have in addition to the salvation that you just gave me and the salvation that I now have, what I'd really love to have is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not so that I can do miracles myself. It's a common misconception. It's so that I can sell it to other people. That they can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and that they can do that. And do you remember what Peter said to Simon the Sorcerer? He said, your money perish with you for your heart is not right in this matter. You are somebody who is trying to claim that you have God. But your heart has hold of some really physical and some really carnal ideas. Now, this does not mean at any one point in time that we should not take care of our family. It doesn't mean that we should not have physical possessions or worldly goods. But what it does mean is that sometimes our anxiety comes from trying to play both sides. If we're Christians, we need to act like Christians. We need to think like Christians. And so maybe what we need to do first is take a long look within and see if we are truly the type of people that God asks us to be. And then I would ask you to look around. This may be the most controversial thing. I, don't, I never know if something is controversial when I say it. This may be the most controversial thing I say. But despair and sadness and depression, all these different things, is really at its core a selfish notion. And I'm, this is coming from somebody who struggles with depression. But depression really is a selfish notion. Because what it forces us to do more often times than not is look exclusively at ourselves. We take that first point and we just supercharge that. I look exclusively at myself to the expense of everybody else. And what I'm asking you to do, if this is something you're struggling with today, is to take a look around. 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33. This is a reference we mentioned earlier. 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33. David is in a really, really tight spot. And literally the second half of 2 Samuel is just one big catastrophe after another, if you will. But in 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33, this coup by Absalom has finally reached its zenith, if you will. Absalom is dead. The people are kind of scattered all over the place. And David, rightfully as any father would, mourns not only for the death of his son, but also for the situation as it's presented itself. And in verse 33 of 2, Kings, or 2 Samuel 18, it says, the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. That's an understandable statement that he's making. David understandably says, I would give my life if it meant that my son would live. Every father in this room understands that perception. But what's he missing? What he's missing is, as Joe points out here in just a second, what he's missing is, is the fact that if Joe, or I'm sorry, if Absalom had in, ended up actually taking the throne from David, it would have been an absolute mess. The people would have been divided even more than they already were. And it also would have meant that the throne of David would have been taken by blood. It would have been a disaster for everybody. And so Joab, in 2 Samuel 19, one of the rare shining moments of, Zo of Joab's life, in 2 Samuel 19, and verse 1, it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom, something he shouldn't have done. Because at its core, Absalom was just a coup. He was just a traitor. He was a rebellious son. 
Verse 2, the victory that day was then turned into mourning. For all the people, for the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth in the city. That day is the people who humiliated steal away when they flee in battle. There's no victory there. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house of the king, slapped some sense into him. I added that part. And said to him, Today you have covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who today have saved your life. And the lives of your sons and your daughters, the lives of your wives, the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. Do you see the error, David? You've gone backwards in this whole thing. The people who have laid down their lives for you, you're disrespecting them. The people who have taken up arms against you, those are the people that you're mourning for. He says, you have shown today, verse 6, that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore, arise, go out, speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass the night with you. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come from you, your youth, until now. That is quite a bit of evil. But what did Joab do? In that moment, Joab provided the reality check that David so desperately needed. Because in our moments of grief, and our moments of sadness, when we are at the bottom of that dark valley, and all we can think about is ourselves, it's that moment that we need to take a step back and just look around. Look at the other situations. One of the best things that we can do when we're in those moments is to look at other people and say, not just how bad other people have it to make yourself feel better. It's not really the point, but look around. See where you can be of service. Put your life in perspective to other people. Yeah, it's bad, but it's not as bad as that. You pull yourself out of that. Because the truth is, we need you, ladies and gentlemen. Not only do I need you, not only do the elders need you, not only do the deacons need you, but John Simon needs you. I just happened to point at him. Colton really needs you. We all need each other, guys. We need each other to pull ourselves up. The strength of a church is not based on a number of superheroes that they have, but how we're able to pull each other up, especially in these moments. But I would also tell you that we need to look towards God. Look in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Look in verse 7. I'm sorry, look at God's people. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Look at the perspective that our situation presents itself with. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 7, he says, It is for discipline that you endure. That's a perspective that nobody wants to have. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. That's a hard pill to swallow. Because he says if you're not going through any kind of tough times, then you really need to evaluate yourself to see if you're standing true with God. Because everybody that stands with God will face tough times. Furthermore, verse 9, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to them, I'm sorry, to the Father of spirits, and to live? For they disciplined us, verse 10, for a short time it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. He's talking in Hebrews chapter 12 about the nature of persecution. And the nature of persecution is, is that it forces us to look within ourselves and see, do I really believe in God or do I not? Persecution makes us reevaluate things. It's a signal from the world to tell you that you're not on the right track. When what God says in Hebrews chapter 12 is that persecution is a sign that you're actually on the right track. For what person does a father have, or what son does a father have, that they don't discipline from time to time? What person does God have that doesn't undergo persecution from time to time? If you don't, you're illegitimate children. That's what he says there. Look at the persecution. Look at your life and see it from a broader perspective. But then also look at verse 12. I love these verses. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths through your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Look around and see your suffering and your situation with the right perspective. And then seek to strengthen other people where you know you can be. Galatians chapter 6 says very simply, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. That's a profound scripture. Because it forces us to move outside of ourselves and look at areas by which we can serve. After you've looked within, after you've looked around, I would encourage you to look up. There's a really interesting moment in Acts the seventh chapter. And I, I love Acts chapter 7 because it's just one enormous takedown from somebody that's not Jesus towards the Jews. 
And Stephen stands his ground for 50 plus verses telling the Pharisees exactly what they needed to hear. They didn't want to hear it. He tells them exactly what their situation is like with God. He tells them everything about their life, about their history, about their situation, and they murdered him for it. But in verse 55, Stephen, as he's sitting there watching the stones come towards him, these are not little pebbles, these are enormous boulders that they're tossing towards him with the intention to crush his most vital organs, Stephen glances up towards heaven and notices Jesus standing, not sitting at the right hand of God, but standing at the right hand of God. Some people have speculated that Jesus is standing up to respect his first martyr. Whether that's true or not, I don't really know. But it does provide an interesting color to that. Stephen, in the most dire moment of his life, which would be ultimately the end of his life, he looks up towards Jesus. It tells a lot about his life. We have a tendency sometimes to work within towards our own problems. See the only things that we're going through, or see only the things that we're going through. Or when we look around and we see problems on this earth, we say, oh, the news are telling me this is bad, and the news is telling me that's bad, and John's over here talking about this, and Jeff's over here talking about this, and all I'm concerned about is these things, when in reality what we need to be doing sometimes is looking up into heaven and seeing God for who He is, the ultimate perspective. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, same chapter that you're probably still in. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, and this comes right on the heels of the Hall of Faith, comes right before the persecution chapter of Hebrews 12. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's a mouthful. Put aside the encumbrances. Run the race. That's, that's our daily life. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. The author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And just to add some perspective to the situation, he says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that he will not grow weary and lose heart. Sometimes what we need in our life is not to just continue to look within and reevaluate our own self and drive ourselves nuts over it. And maybe what we don't need is to look around at everybody else's problems and say, okay, how can I serve you? Maybe what we need to do sometimes is fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and see the end goal. Because when we look towards the goal, everything else just kind of fades into obscurity. It's still there. We still got to pick it up tomorrow. But everything else kind of fades into obscurity. It gives us that eternal perspective that we so desperately cling to. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul has the ultimate perspective on this when he talks about the persecution that he endures as exactly what it is, treasure and earthen vessels. That the gospel that exists within himself, the life that exists within himself, is just a physical vessel for something that is ultimately spiritual. That's the perspective that we need sometimes. Who we are and who God is. There will always be times in our life, and I say this as a man with extensive wisdom and knowledge at 36 years old, there will always be time in our life when we're in the valleys. When we're in periods of time that are so dark, we can't even see the mountaintop. And it's in those moments when we feel like giving up, but that's when we remember the song that Nathan led for us so well, one step at a time, dear Savior. Sometimes days aren't taken in leaps and bounds, they're taken in footsteps. In footsteps towards God, there's always progress. The perspective that we need pushes us and propels us forward. And if that's your situation, and maybe you don't need baptism, maybe you're already a Christian, but if that's your situation and you need prayers, I'm up here. To have people pray for you and give you whatever you need. Come as we stand and as we sing. God.